You're listening to Saturday Morning Media. And now, back to our show. Under the Puppet is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons. To support the show and hear new episodes before anyone else, become a patron. Visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media for more information. And thank you for your support. Welcome to Under the Puppet, the show that talks to professional puppeteers about the art and business of puppetry with the sole purpose of helping you up your puppet game. My name is Grandpa Choco, and this is Under the Puppet. Welcome to Under the Puppet. My guest this episode is none other than John Tartaglia. John rose to fame starring in the opening cast of Avenue Q on Broadway, where he was nominated for a Tony Award. But as you'll hear, his puppetry journey started long before that, when he became the youngest puppeteer on Sesame Street. Over the years, John has created and starred in puppetry shows for stage and screen, and his current show is the Jim Henson Company Splash and Bubbles, airing on PBS. I visited John Tartaglia in his office on the Jim Henson Company lot to record this interview. John Tartaglia, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank you. I'm Finally here. So excited to, <laughs> to have you on the show. Um, I'm going to start as I always do. Do you remember your first exposure to puppetry, like the first time you saw puppets? I mean, I'm sure the very first time I saw it was like Sesame Street or mm-hmm. Mr. Rogers or something like that. But the first time it like it impacted me was watching Fraggle Rock. When Fraggle I was, Rock. When I was about seven years old. That just like I remember seeing that kind of puppetry and that level of puppetry was like mind-blowing to me and were you able at that age to 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 know like oh these are puppets like these it's not magical creatures yeah <laughs> these are puppets. no i definitely knew they were puppets and i think i think the part that intri- i mean i was kind of half intrigued i was like intrigued by the show and the stories and the characters i loved that but i also was like how are they doing that like that's all mm-hmm. i kept thinking was how are they doing that and i want to do that right you know that it was kind of like a dual fascination right now were your parents creative they they are and they were. Uh, my my mom is an actress, uh, so I grew up going backstage in theaters and grew up basically in theater. My father's a musical director and a pianist, so I was was around music and you know went with him on a lot of his gigs. Um, you know, so I was I was always kind of exposed to to theater and and creation. So I feel like I never like people always ask me like, what would you do if you weren't doing this? I actually don't know. Like I don't remember a time where I wasn't doing something like this. Yeah. Yeah. I know you joined Sesame Street at a young age, but before that, what made puppetry something you wanted to pursue? I think it, it was a, like a way to be something that I wasn't. I think that, you know, which I'm sure was like, I'm sure there's some psychological, like, you know, my parents got divorced. I'm sure there's some sort of like, I wanted to escape. Like, I'm sure there was something there. But honestly, I think what it is in my core, what I feel is like, I think I loved making people laugh and I loved being I loved characters I loved voices I loved goofiness and mm-hmm. humor and I think puppetry just allows for all that because you're you're not limited by you know at the time being a seven or eight year old kid there's like you know five roles I'm, I'm gonna get cast as but with a puppet on my hand I could be anything right and I could play an old lady I could play a chicken I could play a, a letter I could play a monster I could play anything and I think that's what really attracted me to it was I got to use that part of me that, frankly, I didn't even know I had until I started doing it. You know, it's like yeah. it's like you don't really discover that you like to do characters or voices until you're given an opportunity to get in front of an audience and do that somehow. Right. So puppetry was kind of like a self, like you could, you know, you can make it yourself, right? Like right. You, you can, you, that's the great thing about puppetry is you can build your own stage and you can make your own lights and make your own script and like you can kind of do it all. So I, I think that's what it was. I liked the idea of just being able to be anything. And did you have puppets as a kid? Like... The only puppet I remember having is my grandmother gave me as soon as she heard that I liked puppets at all, she gave me some um, this like 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 Charlie McCarthy like toy ventriloquist dummy. Yeah, which which and no slant against I, I love ventriloquism, but it's just, I could never do that. That wasn't my interest. It was more the you know the Muppet Henson style. So um, so unfortunately, it kind of it got sometimes used in my shows as like a background <laughs> character, but I never really like invested a lot in that one. But that was kind of it. And then everything else was kind of like, I started making my own and started like, you know, doing like what we all do, like the very basic sock puppets. And then, you know, I think I got a book at the library when I was like eight years old about like how to make puppets. That was probably like, you know, from 1940 something. But like it was, you know, basic techniques. And I learned a little bit from that and watching Muppets. And yeah, so I enjoyed making them as much as I enjoyed performing them for a while. Do you still make puppets? Are you still a builder? I do. I mean, I'm like a I'm like an amateur builder. Like I love doing it, and it brings me joy. But I feel like I, you know, you look at these brilliant builders that work for <laughs> for well, that, that that's their profession, and I'm like, oh man, there's I'm nowhere near. But I do it because I love to do it, and because sometimes you have to, you have to just make your own character. You know? Right. Right. Well, uh, let's talk about Sesame Street because you were there when you were 16, and how yes. did that door open for you? 
Uh, it was so it was amazing. I mean, basically, I uh, through a series of uh, crazy events, I I wrote to Jim Henson when I was very young, and I never got to meet Jim. But I guess my letter made some sort of impact because when I was fourteen, this is after he had passed away. I wrote to Kevin Clash at Sesame Street, um, who was Elmo at the time and Baby Dinosaur, which I was like, you know, the biggest fan of Baby Dinosaur and the, and Dinosaurs, which was on the air at the time. And I basically was just like, I'm such a fan of the Muppets. I want to work for you for you guys as a puppeteer one day. And he reached out and basically said, you know, we're always hiring new performers. Why don't you and your mom come to New York and watch us tape? So I went to New York and watched a taping of Sesame Street. And he took me around the workshop and got to meet all the pu- puppet builders. It was basically like, you know, everything I'd ever wanted, right? Right. And then um, he, I kind of said during lunch with him, I said, well, how come, you know, because this is, you have to keep in mind, this is like the height of, Tickle Me Elmo and everything like that. Like, it was a very big time for, for Sesame Street and Muppets. I said, well, why did you, you know, respond to my letter? And he said, well, Jim used to talk about you. And I was like, what? And basically, I guess when I would written Jim that letter, um, he had filed it or he somehow my name stuck out or whatever, and he had mentioned my name to Kevin. And so my name was very familiar when Kevin, when I got, when Kevin got my letter. And so basically, in a very indirect way, I've always said that, you know, I feel like Jim is the was the, is the reason I'm here. You know what I mean? So then from that, Kevin was like, you know, we have these series of workshops and auditions. You're going to have to prove yourself. You have to, you have to go through them. So I would make videos and send in videos. And, um, you know, I, I don't think they do this really anymore, but they used to have these, like, three-day – they call them workshops, but basically they were, like, intensive auditions. Right. <laughs> and they would start off with, like, 50, 60 people, puppeteers, and then they would whittle it down each day. And then I was very lucky to always kind of make it to the very end. Um, and I think it's because I was I was a good manipulator. You know, I was so young at the time. I didn't have a lot of voices. You mm-hmm. know, like I didn't have I didn't have the life experience to know characters that well. I could do imitations, but I didn't really understand how to make a character. Right. But I think because I was a skilled manipulator, there was value in that. So they brought me in when I was sixteen. I started and and I started just doing right handing and background characters and a lot of musical numbers because I could lip sync and I could do I could sing and stuff like that so um, but that's really how it all started and I, so it all started from a letter I wrote to Jim that he responded to and then Kevin recognizing my name and bringing him into these these workshops and auditions and, and you know it was it was looking back it's like I have like like dual memories I have like memories of complete joy and like you know like it was the most glorious thing in the world but at the same time it was also terrifying because right. I was oftentimes like the only like you know, 16-year-old, like, standing in a room full of, you know, grown adults and, like, you know, at these auditions. And everyone is lovely and so supportive and encouraging, but ultimately you start to figure out, like, oh, it's like the Hunger Games. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, we're all competing to stay in this, this this game. So, right. and I didn't know any better, so it's just, I was like, let's all be friends. But <laughs> but it was, it, was a, it was an amazing, I feel very blessed. I think I got in right, kind of, right before things started scaling down. We were still shooting mm-hmm. a lot of episodes, and there were still big, huge puppet scenes in every episode, so... Yeah, I was very, very lucky to be part of that. What is there a piece of advice or a technique that you learned in those early days that you still use today? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think, yeah. I mean, I feel like I, I was I was so around such a, a cluster of different kinds of talent. You know, I mean, you have like a Kevin who is such an amazing manipulator and su- such a good improver, and you have like a David Rudman who's who's such a slick performer in the sense of like his manipulation is so clean and so clear. And then the other side of things, you have like a Jerry Nelson who you know was was admittedly he, you know not the strongest manipulator, but was such an amazing character performer mm-hmm. and such a um, uh, so much heart. I mean, I feel like I would just watch him and have like a master class. And that's not to say he wasn't a great puppeteer. He was a phenomenal puppeteer. But what I mean is he had a very different style right. than maybe the slicker, you know, slicker stuff that we're used to seeing today. And I think what I learned was just that every puppeteer and every performer brings their own style to the plate and that I didn't really start to feel like I was my own performer until I stopped trying to imitate everybody else. I think it was watching the difference between a Carol Spinney and a Jerry Nelson and a Frank Oz and a Dave Rudman and a Fran Brill and a Kevin Clash and watching all these different techniques and different styles and, and just figuring out what, what do I relate to and what's my what do I bring to the table. Mm-hmm. So I think it was just not trying to be someone else. That, that was something that a lot of people there tried to impress upon me because I think when you're young, you do that, right? You try to... Right. You try to imitate somebody else. You try <laughs> right. to do their voice and their. So I think it was not trying to be, not trying to be anybody else but myself. And that took a long time to figure that out. Yeah, yeah. Were you still going to school at this point? I was. Yeah, I yeah. was still in high school. I yeah. 
And when when uh, you graduated high school, did you did you choose Sesame Street over college? Well, that's so that that's a very funny story. So basically, I I had you know I would come in like when when I was between I was like sixteen and eighteen, I would you know when I had like a Columbus Day weekend and Sesame Street would be filming something, I would go, or I would take a couple of days off of school and go up to New York. I lived in Pennsylvania at the time, so I could take the train you know an hour and a half away or whatever. Um, so it, it was it was very convenient in that way. And then when I was 18, my family decided to move to South Florida. And so I applied to, uh, for college, and I had a full in-state scholarship to the University of Maryland. I was going to go there. I gym went there, so I was excited to go to gym school and was going to do uh, was going to do theater there. But also, like the head of theater had wanted to create like a puppetry program and. When we, and I had known him for a long time, so he was like, "Oh my god, this is so great! You're coming. This is great." So, like two and a half weeks before I was supposed to leave, I'd gone through orientation, I'd done everything. I was right before I was supposed to leave for school, and my parents were literally moving like the next week to Florida. I got a call from a woman named Danette DeSena. Danette used to be the talent coordinator for Sesame Street, and she said, "Oh, you know, Kevin wants to bring you in for a few days, you know, in the in the new season, which was starting in September." And I was thinking, "Great, this is great. I'll just take the train up from Washington D.C. a couple times, you know. My, I'm sure my professor will love that because I'm going." <laughs> and then she like read off the list of dates, and it was like, you know, basically like you know three weeks in a row of work and and right. extending, and that was just the beginning of the season. And it was like, you know, we want you September sixth, seventh, tenth, eleventh. I was like, "Oh my god." So I realized, oh, I have to make this is a huge decision to make, and so I remember calling my mom from where I was working at Sesame Place at the time as a as a uh, dancer. I remember I called my mom and I was like, "We have to talk when I get home. Um, <laughs> I'm not really sure what to do." And I was so scared. And I remember talking to them, and I was like, "Okay, well, here's what's going on." And you know, the the practical side of my of my family was like, "Well, that's you know, you have a scholarship, and you know, you you should go to college." And but the but the performer and and. Uh, side of my family and the the passionate side of my parents knowing how hard I worked to do this and how much I loved it was like this is a once in a lifetime opportunity and my mom basically and my stepfather were like will you spend the next if you go to college will you spend the next four years wondering what 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 if mm-hmm. what I should have done and I said absolutely I know that <laughs> right and they said then, then that's your decision so but they were like and I'm really thankful that I always say that this is this is why I believe that I was able to do what I was able to do is they said if you're going to do this then you're going to be an adult. You're making a very adult decision. So if you're going to do this, you're going to move to New York City. You're going to get your own apartment. You're going to live by yourself. You're going to pay your own bills. You're going to pay your rent because you're making that choice to skip those four years of transition. Right. And they're like, and by the way, there's no right or wrong, but if this is what you're going to do, and of course, you know, of course they're going to be there if something goes wrong, but they didn't say, oh, don't worry, we'll take care of everything. Right. right. So, so yeah, my, my mom and I went to New York City like four days later and spent two days looking for an apartment. I don't know how we found a place, but we did a little apartment on Upper East Side. I had a great neighbor who, who kind of looked after me and that was it. And like, it was so weird to like go from like, you know, prom and high school <laughs> and graduation right. to like three or four, whatever weeks later being like an adult writing checks and paying rent. And, and that's literally what happened. And then, you know, I never looked back. So, yeah. So yeah, it was, it was definitely like, an unexpected thing to have to deal with. But, you know, I feel like I know that if I had gone to college, as much as it would have been great, I would have been constantly wondering, like, oh, did I just lose that opportunity? Right. You know? Um, well, how amazing that your family was so supportive of that decision. Because I could think, yeah. uh, my mom is very, very supportive, but I know my mom would be like, you're going to college. <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right, That's what right. you're going to do. Right. Like, this is, uh, m- maybe not. But I, I just know that there's a lot of parents who that wouldn't have even been yeah. an option. I think if be. my family hadn't come from a performing background, maybe they would have been like, what? But I think that they knew that. You know, with with show business, opportunity only comes a few times. Right. And so I think that they knew that I would be, and also they they knew they they. I think if I hadn't gone up and worked a bit before that, it would have been scary for them. But I think that they they knew they knew a lot of the people that I was dealing with. You know, Danette, who was our talent coordinator, ended up being you know almost like a, a like a like a second or third mom to me in New York, and she would you know she basically said to my mom like, "Don't worry, I'll look after him." So I think that gave them some peace. It's not like I was like going off to like a foreign country or something. Right. You know I mean, it was like they, they knew that I would be okay. I think what killed them most of all wasn't even me not going to college. It was the fact that they were moving so far away to Florida. So it's not like living in Pennsylvania where they could have jumped on a train to get to me if they needed to. Yeah. So that was, my mom like cried a lot. So, <laughs> but, <laughs> then, but then we were good. Well, let me, I think I know the answer, but all these years later, was that the right choice to make? Oh my God, yes. Yeah. Well, you know what? Not just because who knows what would have happened career wise, but also honestly, because of how Sesame Street has changed, it was it was those four years, uh, those first those first four years, were really the years that changed uh, that I saw the most evolution on this show, and I think 
it was still such a good time to be an ensemble puppeteer there because there was so much work still. Mm -hmm. And also that was the time when um, Avenue Q came into the fold. So if I hadn't been there in the city working and I hadn't established myself as a puppeteer, maybe that wouldn't have happened. So I feel like, you know, I'm a big believer everything happens for a reason. So I feel like, you know, whatever little voice inside of me was like, do this. I'm right. glad I listened to it. Right. Well, you mentioned Avenue Q, and I'm going to ask you about that. But I, I wanted to ask, uh, you are an amazing actor, singer, and dancer. Did you take lessons? Um, not officially. So I think it's the same thing. I think being around my mom and my father and my, my family, I think, um, you know, my stepfather was amazing. He would drive me to Sesame Place every day for work and stuff like that. Like, I always had a family around me that supported me. My mom used to teach voice, so I learned a little bit from her on that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I certainly, don't get me wrong, I certainly took classes and things like that, but right. I, I never, like, went to school proper for it. I think it was just, like, and I always say this to people, like, I am definitely not the most technically trained person in all aspects, but what I am is very instinctual. And so I think that I think that I always, you know, I can't imagine not performing, and I think that always felt right to me. Um, and I'm a really good, I'm a really fast learner, and I'm a really good imitator. So there were things, like dancing at Sesame Place, I'm not a dancer. I can dance, I can move, I can, I have great rhythm, but I'm not a dancer. Right. But I could certainly fake it. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, and so it's like stuff like that. I think I, I think I just always had that little, you know, my, my grandmother uh, was a singer, and her father was a clown. So I think down the <laughs> generations, like, if you look back, I'm like, oh, all these things kind of like found their way to me somehow. You know, yeah. I don't know who the puppeteer was, but you know, I'm sure I'll figure <laughs> well, that you. out eventually. Yeah, you have changed I, was, it, yeah. I had to add that to the, to the, to the soup, I guess. Yeah. To the list, yeah. Well, um, you were in the original cast of Avenue Q, and um, that opening cast had some amazing puppeteers in yourself, Stephanie DeBruzio, Jan Barnhart, and Rick Lyon. Um, did you have to audition for those parts, or were you guys brought in as ringers, uh, puppeteers? Yeah, it was really, you know, this is one of those things, like, whenever whenever I've done, like, talks at, like, schools or things like that, and people say, like, what's your career advice? I always say, don't say no, never say no, um, it, within reason. Like, you know, you should always be open-minded to things. So so what happened was, um, Jeff Marks, who was one of the composers, or, or is one of the composers of Avenue Q, uh, was an intern at Sesame Street. Okay. And, and um, self-admitted and not a good intern, <laughs> and he got fired. <laughs> but he he loved the puppetry, loved Muppets, and loved everything about about what we did. And so he and Bobby Lopez, um, you know, came up with the idea for Avenue Q and started writing it. And um, they first they wanted to do like a, they actually wanted to write like a genuine Muppet movie, and they they like wrote up a treatment and pitched it, and it didn't get any, anywhere. So then they said, let's write our own thing. And uh, when they realized that it would be a parody of, of Sesame Street or a parody of children's television, they said, well, let's let's actually, you know, have real puppeteers do this who can sing and dance, you know, and be part of this. And it wasn't going to be a theater piece. It was going to be a TV show. It was going to be like a – like their idea was it's like a Comedy Central adult Sesame Street. Got it. So when we did this first presentation, um, literally the phone call was, hey, there's this composer – that you know, uh, I think I think it was Laura McLean, uh, who's an amazing wrangler and puppet builder and performer, who who called and was like, "Hey, there's this composer Jeff Marks. He and his friend Bobby wrote this show called Avenue Q, and they want to make it a, a sitcom for TV, and um, <clears throat> they want to do like a live um, uh, performance of it, you know, for 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 an audience just to see how people react to it. Do you want to do this?" And it was like, you know, there was no money, there was nothing. Like there was, you know, it was one of those like, "Do you want to do this kind of fun thing?" And right. I literally was like. Sure, and actually, what's funny is I had something that that week or that night that I had already said yes to that was like that was like a paid thing, I think. But I was like something inside of me like was like you you should do this. You actually like this is what you love to do. You should do it. So I said yes, thank God. And and at the time it was like four four skits and like five songs, and we did it at this place called uh, the York Theater, um, and it was a bunch of invited a lot of friends, but also just like industry people, and people went nuts. They went crazy over it. And we you know we just held the puppets up next to us because you know that's just what we were used to doing. There was no sense of like this is the style of the show, right? But people loved watching us perform the puppets as much as they loved watching the puppets. And so one of the producers, Robin Goodman, apparently went up to Jeff and Bobby afterwards and were like, "This this could be a TV show, but this needs to be a live theater piece." And that's what kind of spurred the show. So so to answer your question, it's a very long winded way of saying that I. We never had to audition for our roles. We basically just like were asked to do it, and I guess because right. we we didn't fail miserably, <laughs> they, kept, <laughs> they kept us on. But I always would say as a joke to our producers, like half joking, half completely serious and terrified. Like I know you guys are going to bring in like Joey McIntyre to replace me. <laughs> I know you guys are going to bring in, like Neil Patrick Harris to replace me for Broadway, right? Because <laughs> I kept thinking I was like they're not going to give this like you know twenty something kid who has no real huge theater credits at the time you know uh, the opportunity, and they did. They really believed in us, so. 
So out of the seven original cast members, five of us made our Broadway debut, which wow. was pretty pretty substantial. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, did you learn anything about puppetry from doing that show? Yeah, actually, I think I learned a lot about, and this is a lot because of our director, Jason Moore, I think I learned a lot about um, how overpowering puppetry can be compared to us as performers, meaning that we had to learn a lot about like how, how to share with our character how do I put this? Like, in other words, because the show was so unique in that, you know, we weren't trying to hide us. You know, we weren't doing the, the traditional Boon Raku thing where, you know, we weren't wearing masks. Right. We weren't dressed in total blackness. We actually had costumes that were that were gray, but, you know, we didn't we didn't disappear because you saw our faces. Um, it was a lot about learning how to share the stage with your character and how and, and that's really like, you know, some people have a hard time with that because there's times where the puppetry has to be the most important thing and you have to pull back. And vice versa. There's times where you have to give a little bit more than the puppet so that the audience can really understand what the emotional relationship is. So I think it was learning balance, a lot of balance. I actually learned a lot about um, also just uh, timing, a lot about comic timing. You know, having a live audience every night for so many years, right. you learn so much about you know how mechanical comedy is, which you don't always get in television because you're usually not in front of an audience, right? Right. So that was a great lesson like a lot I, I feel like I learned from a lot of greats there like watching Anne Harada who's you know such an amazing performer and watch how she would adjust herself every night and how she'd react to laughs now she'd land laughs every night um so it was kind of a lesson in puppetry but also honestly a lesson in just like really good storytelling really good theater which which is also so much of what puppetry is yeah yeah well you were nominated for a Tony Award yes for that um did you ever have the idea that puppetry would lead you to get a Tony Award nomination no, no in fact I was just saying the other day that like you know, I dreamt about being on Broadway, and that was certainly a, a dream of mine, and I pursued it when I moved to New York. You know, when I wasn't doing Sesame Street, I would go on theater auditions and go out. Right. And, um, but I, and so I dreamt of it, but I would have been happy to be, like, branch number four in the back of The Lion King. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. I wasn't looking to, like, I wasn't assuming I would star on Broadway in a lead role and get a Tony Award nomination for it. Um, but what I would say to people, what's, what's really weird is, like, I, I'm a very visual person. Like, I, I really believe if you visualize something, it can, it can happen. And I always saw in my, in my head, like, that feeling of being on a Broadway stage with a spotlight. Like, I just, something about that I could picture, I could feel that. So opening night, I remember, it was weird. It was like, I had, like, a deja vu where I was like, oh, I saw this. I saw this moment. What I didn't see was holding a puppet next to me. <laughs> right. So, like, that's the part that I'm like, if you had told me, like, years before that, like, oh, you're going to make your Broadway debut... <laughs> you know, in a musical, and you have a puppet on your hand. Like, I was, like it's such a weird thing if you think about it. Like, yeah, especially that kind of puppet. You know, right? It's such a, it's such a perfect blend of what I love to do. Yeah, but that's why I think it happened because I think it's like it's the two things I, I they were always f- not fighting, but they were always they were always uh, racing each other a little bit. Like when I wasn't doing puppetry, I was doing theater. When I wasn't doing theater, I was doing puppetry. And I was never one hundred percent happy either way. And all of a sudden, blam! It, it kind of came together. So I feel like it was some weird. I guess meant to be thing, but right. but yeah, I would have never like you could have paid me money. I would have been like, ah, I don't think so. You know? Yeah, <laughs> you see yourself in the spotlight, and then it widens a little bit. Yeah, there's a yeah, puppet, yeah. Right? Like, wait, there's some you. flash of orange next to me. What's happening? Yeah. yeah. Well, um, in 2007, you created Johnny and the Sprites. Yes. Uh, that debuted. Uh, was a, at first, it was a series of little, little five minute segments on yeah. Playhouse Disney. Where did the idea for that show come from? So that was really funny. This is, a, this is a good lesson in, like, make sure that you are as organized as possible, which I am not. But so I got a letter uh, when I was still doing Avenue Q on Broadway in 2005 from Rich Ross, who was the president of Disney Channel at the time. And he'd come to see Avenue Q, and he was like, you know, I really want to meet with you and have dinner and, and talk about possibilities. And I literally, and this, this sounds so awful, and I'm just, I'm going to put it out there and say, like, I, I'm not making an excuse. But at the time, we were doing so much press and doing so many things that I, I, I just was awful about, like, responding to things. And, and, and actually, any of my friends will tell you that, like, I'm great at texting. I'm awful at everything else. <laughs> so anyway, so I put the letter next to me at my dressing room station, and I forgot about it. I got buried under other things. And to his credit, he could have been like, you, you idiot. You know, but instead, right. he wrote me, like, a second letter. It was like, oh, you must not have gotten my first letter. <laughs> I was like, oh, of course not, huh? Um, so we finally had dinner, and he basically said... Um, you know, he just said that he had seen my work on Sesame Street and obviously loved Avenue Q. And he said, um, have you ever thought about creating your own work? And honestly, I had, but I always thought of it like a lot of us do. Where I was like, oh, when I'm like 80 and I win the lottery, you know, right, <laughs> like, right. like, I'll make my own shows one day. And I, so I said, well, of course, who doesn't think about that? And he said, well, would you, th- would you want to think about creating something for us? And I was like, what? Um, and so I panicked a little bit because to all of a sudden be given that opportunity, you know, I was 25, that opportunity right. out of nowhere was a little shocking, you know. 
And so, luckily, when I was 16, I had thought about this idea of these... I, I love fantasy, and I love... You know, I'm sure it comes from the Fraggle Rock, Dark Crystal, Labyrinth love that we all have. Right. But I loved the idea of doing anything that had to do with um, fairies and mystical creatures, and, and I love anything that's set in the woods and things like that. So, um, I had written down this, like, very simple idea when I was 16 for these characters named Basil and Ginger and their friends that were sprites that lived in the woods. And that was all I had, but I kind of, like pulled that out of nowhere was like what do you think about this and he he loved it he was like that sounds really cool and then my co-producer and co-creator said well, why don't you put yourself into it and i was like i don't think so <laughs> and she's like no like he likes your work so you should be in it and i was like really like i really didn't think that any, i didn't have any desire to be that i just right. wanted to puppeteer on it you know i wanted to create it and so then i She's like, yeah, it should be Johnny and the Sprites. And that was kind of where it all came from was like, you know, it was like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, I guess I could be on screen. Okay. Like, and that's when they were like, yeah, let's do this. So it was kind of like a, a really out of nowhere happy accident that happened. Um, but, but yeah, so then we shot these shorts in 2005. They did really well. And then we went to series and it was on the air in 2007. So it's, it's amazing. It all happened like that. Yeah. And I think it's an interesting lesson or not necessarily a lesson, but a story, too, because I think a lot of times puppeteers – uh, Avenue Q is more of an adult thing. Yes. Um, and I think people think like, oh, I don't want to do a lot of adult stuff because then I wouldn't be able to do kids stuff because mm-hmm. people will just think of me. But you got to – you were lucky in that you get to do both. Yeah. And it's funny because a lot of people said like, you know, did like were you itching when you did Avenue Q? Were you, were you like itching to, to not do a kids thing? And I was like, no. I was like, for me, it's like I love the work I love wherever it comes from. You know, if it's character – if it's character work, it's character work. Um, I will say that it was – it was probably very brave of Disney. Like, now I feel like it's not a big deal. Like, if you think about, like, you know, SNL performers, you know, who do right. much racier material in some ways than Avenue Q does, you know, they, they're doing voices on PBS shows and stuff like that. But at the time, it was still kind of new. And I think, you know, taking some guy who did Avenue Q, where my characters were doing very inappropriate things on stage, and, like, having me be, like, you know, the face of this, like, kids' TV show probably was a bit of a risk for them. But I think also people are smart, and they went, you know, actually what happened was a lot of parents... We're like, oh, that's the guy from Avenue Q. <laughs> so right. it probably was a brilliant market, I think, on their right. part. But yeah, I mean, I, I feel, I guess I'm lucky that I've gotten to do both, that I have never been pigeonholed as just doing kids or just doing, you know, something more adult like Avenue Q. Um, how did you cast the sprites, the, the puppeteers for the sprites? Did you have auditions and, like, were you involved in that? We did. I think the only character that I was pretty sure I knew who I wanted it to be was Ginger. Mm-hmm. Because I love Leslie Carrara Rudolph and I'd worked with her on a bunch of different things and um, I just, I you know I just knew that her energy was right for that character, um, but I, even still she had to audition for it. And we we I felt like it was fair to offer everybody as many people as possible the opportunity to audition. I know for me I'd been not always invited to audition for things and how hurtful that can be. So I tried to invite as many people as possible, and it was hard. It's like it's like you know all of a sudden these people who I had learned from. I was suddenly asking to audition for my show. Right. And so there was a really weird, like, I had, like, several, like, nervous breakdowns about, like, <laughs> people hating me. And so it's, it's hard. It's, like, yeah. it's weird to all of a sudden, like, I remember Carmen Osbar, who performed Lily, uh, you know, she had been one of the first people to, like, befriend me on Sesame Street, you know. And I, and I was when I was a 16-year-old kid and kind of take me under her wing. And um, so it was really surreal and funny to all of a sudden, like, you know, be ha- asking her to audition and hire her for a job. It was just such a weird thing. <laughs> right. But it actually made us better friends, I think. And I, and I, and I think it's a, it was such a great lesson about, like, everyone has something different to contribute, you know, and everyone has a different strength and everyone has something that they bring, a value that they bring. And so, I don't know, I feel like... I learned more about puppetry on that set, even though I wasn't always puppeteering. Puppeteering, Because I get to actually just observe my friend's work and not have the pressure of, you know, getting my head out of the shot or doing this right. Like, I was actually like, oh, I'm – you know, does that make any sense? Like, I was was looking at it from a different perspective and and it made me – not that I didn't appreciate it, but it made me appreciate it 30 times more because I I got to actually just sit and watch and not have the pressure. It was weird. It was pressuring to be on camera, but I didn't have that pressure. Right. I got to really appreciate the art of puppetry even more. Yeah. Well, how exciting was it that when the show got picked up? Was it or was that exciting or was that like terrifying that it's like, oh, we're doing these five minute things, but now we have to do a whole big show? I think it was, yeah, I think it's exactly right. It was <laughs> that's, that's the theme of my life, exciting and terrifying. <laughs> um, yeah, it was both. I think it was. Um, well, I mean, we, I was thrilled. I mean, it was a dream come true, and and I left Avenue Q right before that, so there was a little bit of like, oh god, like you know, it, I'm, I'm a big jumper. I always say like, uh, there's people who like stand on the cliff. And, like, decide if they should, like, they, t- they put their foot over the side a couple of times and they go back and forth. And then there's people like me who, right or wrong, we just jump and we hope we land. And so I'm a big jumper. I kind of left Avenue Q at, at, at a time when it was 
still very popular and I only been in it two years and a lot of people thought it was crazy, but there's something inside of me that knew that I needed to, to, to move on. And, mm -hmm. um, and so if this hadn't worked out, it probably would have been a really bad choice. <laughs> but it, it happened to work out. So it was exciting. It was, it was terrifying, though, to all of a sudden be like, oh, now I have to come up with, you know, with my, with my co-creators, we had to come up with, you know, 26 half hours of entertainment. Right. Um, but also, I mean, come on, what a, what a wonderful, terrifying problem to have. <laughs> right, like, exactly. I mean, like, may we all be so lucky. So it was, it was, it was exciting. And I felt, um, I don't know, I guess it was cool to finally be creating something that had been the reason why I had the opportunity at all because I grew up watching this kind of a thing so I think I felt a great responsibility to like create a show that of the same hopefully the same heart and hopefully the same quality that I had grown up emulating like a Fraggle Rock or Sesame Street or something like that you know yeah well um, one of your accomplishments that I personally find incredibly inspiring is um, sort of the journey of the show Imagine Ocean yeah and uh, I'd love to break it down a little, if that's okay. Yes. Uh, first, can you tell folks who may not be familiar with the original Imagine Ocean what that is? So Imagine Ocean uh, is a, uh, well, depending on what version you saw, it's a either 23-minute or 50-minute version, a, a pu live puppet show that um, takes place in blacklight. So um, literally from lights up to lights down, it's only UV light. And we it takes place under the ocean. Um, there are characters in it that are similar to the characters you might know <laughs> in, in Splash of Bubbles. Um, uh, and we, we first created it for Royal, uh, Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines. Um, they wanted like a, a really interesting, um, you know, 20 something minute show for their kid. They have a little kids theater on mm -hmm. their big ships. And so we created it for that. And then there was such an amazing reaction to it that um, we decided to bring it off-Broadway. So we did an off-Broadway production that we expanded that ran at New World Stages uh, for about two years off-Broadway. Um, and so and that went on tour for a couple of years after that. Right. Um, but yeah, so if you can picture, like, you know, it's, it's basically like, you know... I always joke it's like it's like seventies college like dorm room where like we're like we have like your Elvis light up velvet right. black light black light poster. But um yeah, basically it's using UV light to block out all the puppeteers and so all the puppeteers are dressed in black, all the backgrounds are in black, and just these fish and ocean characters pop out. Um and it had original music written by an amazing comp composer who unfortunately passed away recently named William Wade, um, who also kinda comes from came from creation of material from like the highest like he never believed in like oh, this is only for kids, so it should be a kid's song. Like, he really wrote, like, kind of old-school Sesame Street songs where it was like, you really could lift those songs and, like, sing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a, it's kids know it, but it's a beautiful song. Right. You know what I mean? So he liked to come from that same level. So, yeah, so that's what it was. It was this this black light puppet show, basically. Well, I have, a, I have a question. Since you developed it, I did not know the part you developed it for the cruise ship. Yeah. Yeah. Um, does the, was the cruise ship involved in the rights? Like, was the was the company involved in the rights at all? No, we involved? actually they they basically rented it from us. Basically. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. So we were able to we we held onto the rights, which was which that's was, awesome. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is yeah. nice. And um, I I wanted to ask you too because uh, you you mentioned William Wade. Um, uh, who wrote the musical score for the show and stuff. What advice can you give us about working closely with something on a creative project? You know, and, and you're co-creator on Johnny and the Sprites too. What advice yeah. do you have about working with somebody on a project? Well, the kind of, you know, whenever I'm directing or I'm doing anything now or creating everything, I always say like, it, you know, every, the best idea wins. You know, there's no, uh, yes, you know, oftentimes you're in a position where you have to lead something or you have to steer the ship or you have to, you know, if you're the creator of something, you know, it ultimately comes down to your final say or your final vision. Right. But but really, if you look at the, the most successful projects ever, whether it's Disney, whether it's Jim Henson, whether it's Stan Lee or whoever, it's like everyone, all those projects usually came from a place of collaboration. And so I'm a big believer that like, you know, within reason, every idea needs to be heard and everyone needs to have a, a say. And again, like I think if you look at you know, what made the Muppet show so funny? You know, it's not just because Jim Henson said, everyone do what I do. Or it's right. not, you know, it's because Frank contributed something and Jim contributed something and Jerry Nelson contributed something. Yeah. Richard so I, I, I just kind of believe in that. And so I think that's the biggest lesson I've learned with, with, um, with any time you're creating something is don't get so stuck on, don't, don't be so fearful of losing power being in charge that you don't listen to other ideas and that you don't open yourself up to that. Because I think that that's... Um, it's understandable, right? Because it's like it's scary when you're put right. in a position where you have to be in charge of something. But I, I really believe that, like, there's, you know, I, I worked with a, a composer named Janine Tesori who wrote Shrek the Musical, and I remember I asked her a similar thing. I was like, you know, what's the biggest lesson you've ever learned? <laughs> and she told, she told me the story about a musical she was working on that um, uh, it wasn't working. Something wasn't working in it, 
And they couldn't figure out what it was. And she was in the theater one day, and one of the older ushers came over to her and was like, you want to know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. And she told her, she's like, if you did this and you did that, that's why. Because I'm watching people, and they're looking at their watches there. And she was like, oh, my God, you're right. And they they, they fixed this, whatever this was, they fixed it. It changed the show. And right. like literally, so her lesson is always like, you never know where the right idea is going to come from. Don't, you know, it could have been easy for her to be like, you're an usher. What do you know? You right. know, but that's, that's not true. Like sometimes, sometimes people are looking at it from a different perspective and you have to open. How many shows has that usher seen? That's exactly <laughs> right. You know, she probably knows more than anybody. Right. So, <laughs> right. so that, I think that lesson, you know, and I, I do think, again, being around people, the Muppets, I think I, I think if I hadn't grown up in that world, maybe I wouldn't look at it that way. But I think the Muppets have always come from a place of collaboration. So, so I think that's my big. I think I answered your question. I'm not yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. But I, I think it's it's to always open yourself up to the best idea might come from somewhere else, and it doesn't take away from your co- contribution, right? You know, in fact, if anything, it's just going to make it look better. Make it better. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and um, you you kind of brought this up, but uh, imagination was maybe like the basis or something for yeah. Splash and Bubbles. You yes. know, like the genesis of it. Um, how did that new chapter in the show come about? Well, I had a couple of people who come to see it. Um, you know, it's so funny, and I'm sure you feel this way too. Like sometimes when you're in the middle of something that you are working on, you don't see it from the outside perspective. You know, like you you see the things that you know, and like puppetry to me is second nature. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? It's it's like breathing. I just I don't I can't imagine my life without it, and I don't know anything but it. So I don't always think of I don't always look at it from the outside point of view of wow this is brand new. Like I had seen blacklight puppets my whole life. I had seen you know that kind of puppetry so a lot of people come to the show and go oh my god like it looks like a live cartoon it looks like it's popping out and I'm like really like (laughs) I'm sitting there going like oh I saw the arms cross or I saw the rods and they're like no 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 so a couple friends came and they were like you know have you thought about making this into something else turning into a a series animated series and honestly at that point I was like oh I guess I guess it could be sure and then Jill Schinderman who is one of the executive producers of Special Bubbles um uh came with her daughter and actually said oh my god this this could totally be an animated series and you know she works in animation so hearing her perspective I was like ah so it's really funny I I basically cold called Hallie Stanford who is the t- president of television here at the Jim Henson Company and I'd worked with her like 10 years before on a project that shot in Orlando for Discovery Channel for, for Henson um, and I loved her energy I loved her attitude I loved everything about her and so I literally cold called her and said hey I haven't talked to you in like you know six, seven, eight years but would you guys ever be interested in this or that? And I kind of, I think I left a message. She called me back and she's like, I've totally heard about Imagine Ocean. What I didn't know was Brian and Cheryl Henson had, go- had gone to see it. And I guess spoken very kindly about it. And so she's like, so I'm totally aware of it. I haven't seen it, but I'm totally aware of it. Um, she's like, let's talk about it. And so literally just like from there, it just started to kind of spiral and, do- and domino. Not spiral, spiral is bad. <laughs> Snowball, that's the word. Snowball. Um, yeah. uh, and so, you know, and then I, I met with Lisa Henson and told her what the show was. And I guess she heard from uh, Cheryl and Brian. And um, uh, I can't think maybe Holly saw the show in New York. I don't really remember. But I think we had video we could show and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And um, yeah, they got really excited about it. And what I didn't know at the time was they were really trying to find new ways to utilize HDPS, the Henson Digital Performance System. Um, and there was talk about, well, what if we didn't do something that's, you know, human body like, like a, like a Sid the Science Kid, right, where they're like walk around bodies. But we just did something more traditionally puppety. And fish just suddenly made sense to do that with. So yeah. it was one of those like beautiful, happy accidents that it kind of all happened at the right time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's how it all started. And so literally from that cold call to Hallie, you know. Yeah. Well, you you jumped off the cliff again there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> to make that call to Hallie. Yeah, it's yeah. a little. Yeah, and it, it's funny because again, it's like if I look back, I'm like, really? Did I just pick up the phone and call? Like, how <laughs> how kind of you know how ridiculous is that? But yeah. I think I don't know. I guess I come from a place of like, you know, what would I want? I guess I'd want someone to just call me and say, "Would you want to do this?" You know. So I think it's it's that not being afraid to also just you know reach out to people you wanna you wanna collaborate with. Yeah. Well, and it's it's fun to see Imagine Ocean go from blacklight puppetry on yes. stage to digital puppetry, yes. now, which is still it's still the same art form, but com- almost completely different. You yeah, know? yeah, just kind of removing the worry about seeing the puppeteers, basically. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, it's like the biggest change. Yeah. Well, both and both kind of have you remove the puppeteers. Yeah, that's you know, right. Kind of if done right. That's, you right. Know, that's uh, right. I just have to worry about my arm crossing on splash balls. I don't right. have to worry about like you know digitally manipulating the face incorrectly, and that's <laughs> a problem. Right. Um, as a creator, how do you handle the situation when you've created something you're very passionate about? And maybe you already kind of answered this with Best Idea Wins, but then uh, you hear stories about this. The studio or mm. the producers come in and go, well, we think it should be like this. Yes. Yeah, it's, 
it's a challenge. I mean, honestly, it's very it's very hard when you feel like someone doesn't isn't looking at it from the same point of view you are, and not just because you're being stubborn saying you're not looking at it from the same point of view I am, but meaning that maybe they're not looking at the reasons why. And I think what I've had to do, and I'm I like to think I'm a pretty empathetic person, but it's hard sometimes. Is I think you have to look at like what are they looking, what lens are they looking at it from through. Um, and sometimes, honestly, they're absolutely right. And mm-hmm. you're so caught up in your visual and your creation that you're seeing it from the inside only. You're not seeing from the outside, right? And I've learned that lesson the hard way where sometimes it's like you got to listen to people who are like are actually the ones who have to sell it or actually the ones who have to like, you know, uh, get the money for it. Right. But I think sometimes you have to also look in and go, okay, because so, sometimes people come from a place of fear, right? And and the really funny, the kind of, you know, the kind of inside joke about show businesses everyone wants something new and different and no one wants to actually do it <laughs> like, yeah, right. you know what I mean it's like everyone's like we want that number one breakout show but we don't want to do anything different than we've done before right? right so so sometimes it's learning how to how to like you know stair step things or how to like you know or sometimes also just standing up for your work and saying I really think that this is I know it's different or I know you're not seeing it but I really passionately believe it it's kind of knowing when to when to for lack of a better way of putting it this is not the right terminology but when to go to battle and when not to go to battle right you know and that makes it sound like it's always um aggressive it's not but what i mean is like there are definitely times where i'm like oh okay i don't feel that way but i kind of see why you are and i know that you're you're passionate about making helping me to get this to happen so i'm going to listen to what you're saying i'm gonna try to fix it and there's other times where like that little voice inside of you goes I know that this is right. I know this is the right way to do it. I know this is the right vision, and you have to trust it. And you got to take a chance that, like, you might be totally wrong, you know, and you might lose the opportunity. But you have to just like, otherwise, I think then you do start to become formulaic, and you do start to just, you know, yeah. then you lose that creative passion. And I feel like the the, the times that's happened where things haven't worked out, it's because I haven't necessarily kept the passion or kept the, you know, I haven't always trusted my gut. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What advice would you give to a puppeteer or a creator who's developing a TV show pitch or something like that around a puppetry project? Well, the first and foremost thing is, unfortunately, um, puppetry is a really hard sell right now. <laughs> right. It still is. And it's getting better. Thank God it's getting better. But it's, it's you know, a lot of people have pigeonholed puppets. And I think it's, you know, you're only as, you're only are as fond of puppetry based on the last thing you saw. Or what your exposure was. So, you know, you and I grew up in the age of probably like the golden age of television puppetry with Fraggle Rock and The Muppet Show and Sesame Street and Bear in the Big Blue House and, you know, name it. I mean, if you think back to like the 80s, there were so many, even early 90s, there were so many puppet shows on television for kids. And even local puppetry shows. Oh my Which God, you don't yes. see anymore. But no, like, you don't at all. Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and I mean, it's so funny. I always say it's, it's flipped, right? Like I remember growing up, it was like there was puppetry and on television all over the place, not just for kids, for like all over the place. And there was no puppetry in theater. But then now it's flipped, right? Like puppetry right. is in everything in theater and there's very little puppetry on television. And I think it's because television's become, unfortunately, a little bit more like slots. It's like, you know, this show has to appeal to this age group only. And, and so everything's very demographic doubt, you know? Yeah. Um, but anyway, to say all that, you have to be prepared for the fact that a lot of people are afraid of puppetry because the last show that they did that had puppets didn't work. You know, there hasn't really been a puppet show that was a huge breakout success really since like a bear in the big blue house or right. Sesame street. So it's, it's like, okay, so how do you, I mean, it's been great shows, but like, I feel like those are the, like, that's a really merchandisable, huge puppet thing where people are like, yes, this is successful. You know, it's hard. It's really hard. So I think that you have to be prepared. That a lot of people aren't going to see it. <laughs> um, I would say the smartest thing you can do is, is, you know, Frank Oz has that great statement. Why puppets? Mm-hmm. Right. Which, which I think is such a valuable thing that all of us forget sometimes. It's like, you know, why am I doing this with puppets? Is it just because it's it's a I want to do a puppet show, or it's because a puppet's going to be able to do something that a, that a kid or or an animation can't? Right. Right. So it's and and that's a really hard thing to ask yourself sometimes. Is like, is this the best utilization of puppetry? Am I doing it? You know, because like, could you make a show? With those kids as, you know, kid characters, why do they have to be puppets? Are you going to make them do impossible things that they really couldn't do otherwise? Then that's probably a good reason to have them. Yeah. If they're just going to be kind of talking heads, then why not just have real kids? Right. right? So it's it's hard. It's like you have to, I think you, I think you want to, nowadays you want to use puppetry to tell, that's why theater is, is using puppetry so much. It's like, oh, this is a tool to make things happen that you couldn't really do otherwise. Right. So, like, you know, if I need a hyena on stage for The Lion King, yeah, I could put a guy in, like, a hyena costume, put some makeup on him, but what's really cool is if I can actually make that hyena right. and you can see it. So, same thing with puppets. Like, you know, if you're doing a show about monsters, well, then, you know, right away you kind of are in the puppet world. But 
should they be animated monsters? Like, I think you just have to look at that from both sides. Um, But honestly, the real breakdown is it's a hard time to sell a television puppetry thing. I always say to people, create your own work. Put your own work up, you know, online. Show people. You know, what's funny is when you watch people who think that they don't get puppets or don't like puppets, love puppets. And I've had that where I've walked into a picture room with a puppet, and you can hear before the puppet comes out, they're like, I don't know. And then the minute you pull the puppet out, (laughs) they have that interaction. They're like, oh, my God, it's amazing. Right. Right? So it's sometimes puppetry is like you have to see it to really, like, understand it. So I think if you can also create a demo of your own work and if you can show, like, walk into a, um, a pitch or a meeting and press play and say, look how beautiful this looks. Look how cool that looks. Look how funny this is. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's it's, but it's a challenge. I mean, it's like there's like puppet prejudice. You know, it's like right. it's really it's frustrating because it's well, and you can even um, kind of piggybacking on what you said is if if you have an idea for something, you could create a theater piece for it. That's right, because because that's a way to get people to see it. Yeah, and, and that's kind of what unintentionally happened with Imagination. I, right. I didn't create Imagination to be like I'll show television people. <laughs> it just yeah. I had the opportunity to do a theater piece, but. What a great reason to be like, oh, here it is. Come see it. You know, it's, yeah. here's a real live breathing thing. Yeah. Do you prefer performing for film and television or on stage live? I love both. And I yeah. think that's always been actually my struggle is that like, some people are like, oh, God, no, I don't want to do TV or film. I just love theater. And some people are, are the opposite. You know, I get such happiness out of both. Um, there's different highs. You know, I think when you're standing on stage that 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 there's like a visceral like crackling energy in the air because you're on stage and it's live and there's an audience there and if you don't deliver this joke perfectly or you don't make your entrance at the right time or you don't say the line correctly it's not going to work you know mm-hmm. and I love that that give and take or when you know when you do a comedy like Avenue Q and you say a line and the audience laughs and there's you know theater's a give and take right like I always say that, that the audience's energy is just as important as your energy like you got to listen to the room and you got to feel it's like, a, it's like playing tennis back and forth right um, so I love that. But at the same time, I also, there's nothing I love more than being in a studio, you know, with the lights on and it's quiet and all these amazing professionals all concentrating to make something for this little point of view in a camera. And and the fact that you can do things in television that you could never do on, on stage, you know, at least successfully. So I don't feel like I've ever been, I'll ever be 100% happy just doing one or the other. Yeah. Or, yeah. I think it's always going to be a combination of both. Yeah. Well, as someone who is sometimes in a position for casting puppeteers yes. and characters, uh, what do you look for in puppeteers when they come into audition? Well, the biggest thing is, I mean, I do think manipulation is really important. You know, at the end of the day, if you can't silently make a pu- make me feel like that puppet is breathing and alive, then then that's not that's a problem. Do you know what I mean? Because I think I think it, the best puppetry in the world, a Jerry Nelson, a Frank Oz, a, you know, Dave Goals, it's like they don't have to say a line. And you know every single thing that those puppets are thinking. Right. So that's a big thing, right? Um, but the, I think nowadays the big thing is it's coming in with a really great stock of characters and voices. Um, there's a lot of great puppeteers, and I was one of them, so that's why I can say this, who were so busy worrying about the manipulation and so busy worrying about, you know, imitating that they didn't – they haven't created their own characters. Or they can, they can lip sync and they can do choreography, but they can't come up with a funny voice or a funny character. So – um, and again, I did that. Like, I, I'm so glad I had, you know, people who pushed me and, and kind of hazed me <laughs> to say, yeah, it's great. You can move with the puppet, but what's the character? Why is it here? What, where does it come from? What does it think? And it was like, uh, you know, I remember yeah. like being 18, be like, blink, blink. Huh? <laughs> um, so, so I think, you know, as, even, even if you're, even if you're not a theater person, if you have no desire to stand on a stage as yourself, take some improv classes Watch a lot of great improv. Watch a lot of great character-based stuff. Really, really figure out because really, what puppetry is is it's like a heightened version of of the best character work you've ever seen, right? Right. It's like it's like if you took Miss Piggy off of Frank Oz's arm and Frank felt comfortable standing in front of the stage as that character, most likely it would still be a great character. Right. It'd be a little different, but you know <laughs> what I mean. But like 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 he's just using the puppet's a tool to bring out what you have inside of you. So you can't just count on the fact that the puppet's fuzzy and looks cute. It's like, well, that's great. That That's like a three-second slam, right? Like, oh, he's puppet's right. cute. Now what? Yeah. Right? So it's like, what you have to, I think you just, you should concentrate on your own characters and you should bring something unique. I think that's why, like, a Leslie Carrera Rudolph is such a refreshing performer because she is a character. And she, right. and she walks in the door <laughs> and she just, like, is that character and you believe it. And, yeah. there's, and there's no, you don't question whether or not, like, you know, that's coming from a place of integrity or heart or anything. So I think that, that that's what it is. It's really about... I've learned that lesson the hard way. It's create your own characters and be and and understand comedy and understand 
sketch work and things like that because that actually nowadays nowadays really comes into play. I mean, you know, with like Puppet Up and stuff like that, it's like some with improv and stuff like that. It's like you just have to be really on your toes more than you used to have to be. Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a few more questions. Oh my okay. god! Yeah. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, we're, but it's like, we're close. It's like right in your living room. We're close to the a end. Cup of coffee. No, it's great. <laughs> this is all fantastic. And this next question may kind of dial in with what you just said, but if you could go back and give 16 year old Johnny T some puppetry advice, what would it be? Hmm. Well, let's see. There's puppetry advice and there's like work advice. I'd, <laughs> I'd say puppetry advice would be, well, kind of like I said, definitely find your own way, find your own characters. Um, I think it's funny. I think I thought that the theater side of me and the singing side of me and the Broadway side of me was actually a, a negative when really it was a positive. And if you look back at everything I've done that has been successful, it has always come from that side of me. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think I was almost not ashamed of it, certainly, but like th- I think I felt like, oh, but I'm not, you know, uh, um, I'm just giving an example, like, you know, Richard Hunt didn't do Broadway, so I could never be like Richard Hunt, like, you know, who's one of my heroes, you know, so, and it was like, oh, wait, but but Richard brought something that, that you know, that you couldn't bring, and you brought something that Richard didn't get to do, so, oh, that's okay, like, you have your own ways to, to contribute, you know, mm-hmm. I think we do that, where we, we just worry so much about, I don't know, I'm also, peop- I'm a person who worries so much about what everyone else thinks all the time, and I remember being on set, and it's like, instead of going, hey, I think I just did a good take of that, I'd be like, oh my god, was it okay? <laughs> right. You know, and I was constantly looking for approval, and I think, I think maybe that's it, is like, trust yourself a little more, that what you bring is good enough. Yeah. I think from a work perspective, um, 16-year-old Johnny definitely could have shut up and listened a little more. <laughs> you know, I'm a ner- when I'm nervous, I talk a lot, and I try to like, I try to make people laugh, I try to be on all the time. And there were, like, you know, so many people that I've worked with who are, are now friends as opposed to just colleagues, like like a Pam Arciero or, or a Carmen or Stephanie DeBruzzo would be like, oh, my God, you were so freaking annoying because all you did was you were always talking. <laughs> and I realized it was because I was so nervous and I felt so honored to be there that I should have just kind of sat quietly and just listened a little more. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I think it's Tom Hanks has that great quote where they're like, what would you say to yourself when you're younger? And he's like, it's going to be okay. And I think that's definitely true for me. I'm a worrywart. And I think... I look back and I'm like, oh, I'm okay. Like, it's all going to be okay. Right. You know. Right. Yeah. Well, who is a, your favorite puppet character that is not your own character? Ooh, that's a good question. Who's my fam- favorite puppet character that's not my own character? Or it could be a couple favorites. It doesn't have to be just one. Yeah. Well, let's see. I had this weird obsession. I don't know why. I think because she was so out there and so funny. I loved Janice on The Muppet Show. Um, and looking back now as an adult, I think I understand why, because Richard Hunt had that amazing sensibility of like his characters were always off the wall and they were like, they were like very kind of edgy and, and out there, which is definitely something I love. Um, but I loved her. I loved her voice. And I love that. I love the way that puppet moves. And mm-hmm. I got to put it on once and I was like, this is the best puppet ever created. <laughs> um, let's see. So I love Janice. Um, oh, man, I think... I mean, Fraggle Rock, like I said, is such a dream show of mine. I love Red Fraggle. I think that that's like, you know, Karen Pearl, I think she calls it, I might be misquoting, like the Cadillac of puppets because it moves so beautifully and it's such a perfect example of like simple design that allows the puppeteer to really give everything. And I th- I just think her manipulation on that show was so good and her her choices and stuff like that. So that's always been one of my favorites. I guess if I had one more, it would be... Gosh... Pretty much any character on Emmett Otter. Yeah, I think that that was just like watching. I was just I went to that screening the other day and watching, you know, uh, uh, Frank's puppetry and Jim's puppetry and Richard's puppetry and Jerry's puppetry. I mean, you know, especially Jerry with Emmett Otter, just like all the heart. I just love the way that that little puppet moves, and I just love what he brought to that character. So, so yeah. I don't know if that answers the question, but I, I no, feel like great. it's like asking you to choose your children, right? It's like, <laughs> right. It's like I could say Miss Piggy, I could say Kermit, I could say every puppet <laughs> ever. But well, now I'm going to ask you to choose your children. What's your favorite puppet character that you've performed? I, honestly, right, my first reaction is Rod from Mountain uh-huh. Dew Q. I think it's because. Um, He's such a beautiful puppet the way he moved. I could get a lot of great stuff out of him because Rick Lyon built him and he's, he just is, so he fits perfectly and he moves beautifully. But also I loved taking, my favorite thing in the world was when we would do these like appearances with the characters where they weren't like just within the world of the show. Like it wasn't like, here's Rod and Nikki singing If You Were Gay. It'd right. be like Rod and Nikki on the, on the CBS 2 News, you know. And I loved that Rod in person, I created this whole thing where like, you know, on stage, he's like, someone said to me like, uh, this interviewer said, 
you know, is it difficult coming out eight times a week on stage? Which I never thought of it from, from that perspective. And I was like, oh, but, like this is like very early on. And I was like, oh, this is great. Like, yeah, he's playing himself in the show. Right. He's going through the most difficult part of his life. So I totally was like, uh, yes, it's very challenging. And like, I realized like, oh, off camera though, or off stage, he's like very flamboyant. He's very out there. <laughs> and I could flirt with all the newscasters and, and interviewers and stuff like that. And it was just... I think from an improv place, it was like, I, ju- I didn't have to think about him. Like, I think Frank Oz always talks about Grover. He puts Grover on, he just knows who he is. That's like what Rod was to me. Like, I never had to think about what would Rod say here. I just kind of knew. Right. So so I think he's, you know, I mean, I've loved all of them, but I think he's probably my favorite to have ever done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's been the highlight of your puppetry career so far? Oh, God. Well, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like... I. I I feel like I'm very lucky to look back and have like a ton of amazing moments. Like it's hard to pick one. I feel like there's there's just like I would I would say oh Johnny and the Sprites, but then I'm also like ah oh, but Splash and Bubbles oh but Imagination. Like I feel like it's hard to pick. I I think that um well I'll say this the most full circle thing where I've literally been kind of like like literally had that like movie like end of Act Two moment where I'm looking in the mirror going like. You know, look at your life. Look at what you've done. <laughs> is when I've gotten to do Gobo Fraggle. Yeah. For for since since Jerry passed away, and I've gotten to carry that tradition on. And um, you know, I don't feel like he's my character at all. He's not. He's Jerry's character. I just get to I get to do him sometimes. You know, I feel like that'll always be Jerry's character. But um, because like when people would ask me growing up, like if you could have anything in the world, what would it be? The answer was always impossible, which was to work on Fraggle Rock. Which, which had ceased production and you know right. it, it's like that to me like I dream of like what it was like to be on that show and, and do that kind of stuff so I remember when the, the first work with Gobo happened it was so surreal to have him on my hand and to be like oh my god I'm what's happening right now <laughs> and the very first thing I did was a, was a, a bunch, of, bunch of introductions for the hub if you remember the hub with, right. with Karen Prell as yeah. Red so I was also standing with one of my childhood heroes performing the characters that I grew up watching next to somebody who like literally was responsible for me wanting to be a puppeteer so that I think like I still get chills thinking about that because I feel like that was such a full circle like I remember I remember my mom was like look at like look look what you did like <laughs> yeah like I remember six-year-old Johnny or seven-year-old Johnny sitting there watching that show and wanting to be like that so I think for me like that even though I've got to do a lot of amazing things it'd be unfair to just pick one I think that that that's such a full circle like you know, you really never know how things are going to work out because mm-hmm. if you had told me five years ago that, you know, oh, you will get to do Fraggle someday, I would have been like, what are you talking about? Now the show's over. Like, you <laughs> right. just never know, like, where that opportunity is going to come from. I think that's probably true. Yeah. Well, um, as we uh, end here, um, if people want to follow you online and see your stuff, where can they go to check you out? Well, I have a website that is unfortunately so out of date, so I would <laughs> normally tell you to go there, but it's awful. But uh, but I, the best thing is to follow me on Instagram or Twitter. Um, mm-hmm. It's at Johnny Tartags, J-O-H-N-N-Y-T-A-G-S, um, on Instagram and Twitter, or you can find me on Facebook under my name. Um, and uh, I am my goal this year is actually to get my website like back up and running because I'm just so bad about that. Right? Do you have a website? Yeah, you do. Yeah, yeah but it, I, it still goes along. It, I've it goes a long time before it's updated. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I every once in a while I'll go through a spurt. I go, well, I got to put all this stuff up. There. Oh my god! But yeah. I have I have this amazing friend who does my website for me. He's always like, okay, well, I'm ready. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I know. Like, I think I just need to sit down and do it. But yeah. yeah. So hopefully, I guess that's the best way to find out. All right. Well, Johnny, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. I think it's so great to have a place like this for puppeteers and aspiring people to go to and learn. And and you're such a great host. So thank you for having me. Awesome. Thank you so much. My thanks to John Tartaglia for being on the show. I'll have a link to a few of the things that we talked about in the interview in the show notes for this episode, episode number 25, over at underthepuppet.com. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. I welcome your feedback via email at hello at saturdaymorningmedia.com or via Twitter, where the show is at username Under the Puppet. You can also find the show on Facebook by searching Under the Puppet. I want to hear your suggestions for questions I should be asking and for future guests. Let me know who I should be talking to. Thank you so much for listening. We'll talk to you next time right here on Under the Puppet. This episode of Under the Puppet featured music by Dan Ring and was edited by Stephen Staver. Under the Puppet is a production of Saturday Morning Media and is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who've gone to patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up a monthly pledge for as little as a dollar a month. 
Patrons get new episodes before they are released, behind-the-scenes information, and exclusive bonus content. If you'd like to support this show and the other fun content from Saturday Morning Media, become a patron. Head on over to p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Saturday Morning Media and set up your monthly pledge today. You can also tell a friend about the show or leave the show a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thank you so much for listening. Under the Puppet is copyright 2019 Saturday Morning Media Grant Pachoco Executive Producer. All rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. <laughs>